All right, so today we're gonna wrap up genetics. We're gonna talk just a few more things about traits um, and how traits could get passed down. And then we're gonna focus on chromosomes and human heredity. So the first thing I wanna talk about is something called polygenic traits. What does the prefix poly mean? Okay, many. So polygenic traits um, just means that you have many phenotypic traits arrive from multiple pairs of genes. Okay. Um, so many phenotypic traits, and then we just say like from multiple pairs of genes, if you want to shorten that up. Um, and so a phenotypic trait is talking about a phenotype. What is a phenotype? Okay, it's like the physical appearance. What do you actually see? Okay. Um, so what you would show or what kind of outward expression you would have can depend on multiple pairs of genes. So that could be like your skin color, your height, your eye color, your fingerprint pattern. And so when we graph these traits, uh, they form something called a bell curve. How many of you are familiar with the bell curve? Okay, this right here is the bell curve. Um, which just shows like your most extreme ends. You have very few of them. Okay. And then more of like your middle traits, kind of like more of like the average, if you will, um, you're going to see a lot more of it. Okay. So here my graph is skin color. So if you look at skin color, um, it's primarily composed of three different sets of alleles. Okay. Um, and then if you look here at the very ends, we have super, super pale skin and super, super dark skin. And uh, the frequencies of those are very low. So if you think about just like your life experience um, and think about all the humans you've seen with skin color, uh, you probably would agree that you see very, very few people with super pale skin and very few people with super dark skin. And then you can see as you have more of like the middle colors, okay, more medium colors, you see more frequency in those colors. Yes? Okay, uh, same goes for height, right? Height also fits the bell curve. Um, you see very few really short people, very few really tall people. You see a lot of people in the middle. Okay. So make sure you know polygenic traits. You just get multiple phenotypes, and it comes from multiple pairs of genes. Uh, make sure you could link up like skin color or height to polygenic traits. All right. Um, I also want to talk about how environment can influence your traits. Okay. Uh, so environment can play an effect on the phenotype. So again, phenotype is okay. The, the physical appearance. So um, other things can have an influence rather than just your genetics. So environment plays a big role. What kind of animal is in this picture? Fox. Yeah, it's a fox. Um, so here in warmer weather, the fox is going to show darker colors in colder temperatures. Um, it's a lighter color. Another example is the Siamese cat. Okay, so the Siamese cat color also is dependent upon temperature. Uh, so when the cat is developing in its mother's womb, the warmest part of its body is like this middle section, which is the lighter color. And then the like most outer parts of its body are the coldest regions, um, which is how they show that dark color. Okay. So kind of some neat examples. Um, in addition to just color dependent, if you think about humans, we have a lot of environmental factors that would help determine our phenotype too. Um, a lot could just be like, well, what are you exposed to? Think of like radiation, um, but think about like your diet or your lifestyle um, have a lot to do with it because a lot of people can carry genes for things like cancer, right? But it doesn't mean you're going to get it. There's a lot of outside factors that are going to determine if you're going to ever like show a phenotype. All right, so now um, we're going to just wrap up our notes. Our last section is section three, which is on chromosomes and human heredity. So when scientists or geneticists uh, study human genetics, we look at more than just alleles or we look at more than genes. Uh, sometimes we'll study whole chromosomes. And so whenever we have a map of someone's like complete set of chromosomes, that's called a karyotype. So make sure you have karyotype, and this is a karyotype. So it's just a map of all of someone's like 23 pairs of chromosomes. 
They get stained during metaphase of the cell cycle. And then if you look at this picture, do you see a pattern in which those chromosome pairs are organized? Good. Just tell us the shortest. Um, so the way that we just line up the chromosomes is we literally do largest to smallest, except that 23rd pair is the sex chromosomes. So this person is XX. Um, but so we can use karyotypes to study on um, like big pictures. Do they have two chromosomes for each pair like they're supposed to? We'll start talking about non-disjunction. So do they have just one chromosome where they should have two or do they have three chromosomes? And then also when we study chromosomes, we're interested in something called a telomer. Um, how many of you know what an aglet is? Okay, what's an aglet? Okay, if you can see, here's my shoelace. It's like this little plastic piece at the end of your shoelace. What's the purpose of the aglet? Keep your shoelaces. Good, from unraveling. Ooh, I love that. So the aglet keeps your shoelaces from, unla un from unraveling. Well, your telomer does pretty much the same thing in your chromosome, okay? So no, chromosome ends have protected caps called telomeres. If you look at this middle picture, can you see like the squiggly lines in the chromosome? So remember, your chromosome is just all your DNA just really condensed. And so if it just loosened up, it would unravel, just kind of like your shoelace would. Um, so the telomer is there to keep it all tight and compacted in there, just like your aglet does on your shoelace. Um, and so we don't fully understand telomeres and what they do exactly um but right now we think that they have a lot to do with aging so as they get worn out and the dna does start to unravel we think that has a lot to do with why people age and then there's also um some thoughts that it might have something to do with cancer as well so telomeres don't get talked about enough yet they are so so important we know that we need them to keep that dna like nice and compacted in our chromosomes Okay, so when we're talking about chromosomes, remember way back to mitosis and meiosis, um, when we talk about chromosomes, each half is called a sister chromatid. Well, sometimes those sister chromatids don't separate properly during either mitosis or meiosis. Okay. Um, so when this happens, it's called non-disjunction. And non-disjunction is when sister chromatids fail to separate properly. So make sure... You have non-disjunction. You need this first bullet point, and then I'll just kind of highlight in red what else you need. And so if this happens during meiosis, either meiosis one or meiosis two, um, it's gonna cause your gametes to have the incorrect number of chromosomes. Um, so that means you could have like three chromosomes in your offspring, which would be trisomy, or you might just end up with one chromosome which would be called monosomy. And I'll give you examples of each on the next couple slides. And so uh, when this happens, it's a big deal, okay? Especially for humans. Um, there's only a few cases when like your embryo would survive this. Most of the times it's gonna be fatal, which would result in a miscarriage. All right, so an example of having three chromosomes is gonna be Down syndrome. So Down syndrome occurs when there's an extra chromosome on the 21st pair of chromosomes. Uh, so it's called trisomy 21. Trisomy just means three chromosomes, and then 21 is telling you it's that 21st pair. And Down syndrome is, I think, not super common, but decently common. In the U.S., one out of every 800 people have Down syndrome. And then an example of just one chromosome is Turner syndrome, which we may have learned about the, during the genetic disorders. Okay. Um, so Turner syndrome occurs when you just have monosomy or one chromosome. And this happens when there's just one X chromosome. So who does this only affect? Okay, so Turner syndrome only occurs in females. So they just have one X, there's no XX, just X. So non-disjunction, it can occur in both autosomes, which are just like your regular 
body chromosomes, that'd be like the Down syndrome one, or it can happen in your sex chromosomes. You don't have to write anything down on this slide. I just want to show you some examples. Here's a picture from our textbook. Um, just some examples of non-disjunction in your sex chromosomes. Um, so the, here's your first one. XX is just what we call a normal female. A female with Turner syndrome is just X and O is nothing. So just one X chromosome. Um, sometimes you can have two X's go together. So you end up with XXX, which makes like a nearly normal female. Uh, on the male side of things, XY is just a normal male. But you can have XXY, which is Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, you could have XYY, which I think is called a super male, or you're like a nearly normal male. Um, and then nothing in a Y, just a Y chromosome is going to be fatal. So that embryo would never develop. And so finally, um, when we talk about like our chromosomes and we're wondering if there's disorders, uh, fetal testing is available if any like expecting parents or physicians are ever worried about it. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is there's both benefits and risks associated. Okay. So when people are expecting a baby, um, you kind of weigh your odds and we'll look at your background information. You might look at the pedigrees of your family um, and you'll decide, do the benefits of knowing if my baby is going to have like a chromosome issue um, outweigh the risks or do the risks outweigh the benefits? Um, and that's kind of a personal thing, but it is an option that exists out there.